Uh, all right, so thank everyone. I know this is tough being the uh, last speak on a Friday. Everyone's tired and can probably smell beer. So uh, I'll do my best to kind of get everyone to drinking as quickly as possible. Um, I guess I'll just start real quick. Everyone always says you're supposed to start with a joke. I don't have a joke, so I will just sort of reenact my first experience with Joe Armstrong yesterday. Um, so really quickly, I was in the lobby, and I see Joe Armstrong, and he's by himself, and he's got this big red suitcase. And I say, this is great. This is my opportunity to meet the infamous Joe Armstrong. I'm going to go introduce myself. So I go up, and my first thought is to walk up and go, hello, Joe. But I can that idea. So I go up to Joe, and I uh, introduce myself. And I say, hello, Joe. This is Adam Dunnerup from the Huffington Post. I just wanted to introduce myself. And he looks at me with his red suitcase, kind of like half shakes my hand. And he goes, the airline lost my fucking luggage. I said, OK, not going how I planned. So we get into the elevator, and I'm like, all right, let me kind of bring this back a little bit. Maybe, I, maybe he's settled down. So we get into the elevator, and I say, Joe, I just want to thank you for all your work on Erlang. You've been an inspiration in your decades of hard work. And his response to me was, and what the fuck was I going to do for socks? <laughs> if I don't have any socks, I'd have to go shopping. Do you like going shopping? And he walked out of the elevator. So that was my first and probably last experience with Joe Armstrong. So that's my replacement for a joke. So uh, I'm Adam Denenberg. I'm the VP of Engineering at <clears throat> Huffington Post. I apologize. I'm losing my voice. I don't even speak yet. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our journey with uh, WebSockets, SockJS, and RabbitMQ. So a little background. Huffington Post is a uh, now Pulitzer Prize winning social news uh, online newspaper. Uh, we do about 2,000 articles a day, doing about uh, 500 million page views a week, uh, about 12 million unique visitors a week, um, and we're at, I think this is actually a little outdated, probably about 250 million comments now across all of our articles, um, and we're averaging about 2 million comments per week um, across our articles, and you know, a very strong, engaged community around our content. So HuffPost Live. So uh, when I was originally hired, it was to build a new platform called HuffPost Live. So HuffPost Live is a 12-hour live streaming network. Um, and the whole concept was to essentially tap into this community, you know, these people leaving 200 million comments across all of our stories. Um, the idea was to you know, take a 12-hour live conversation um, and bring it to the masses. And you know, the mantra we've always been using is that people don't want to be talked at, they want to be talked with. So we really wanted to bring that community into this conversation. <clears throat> so, you know, part of what we were doing was having uh, real-time commenting, which was a big part of it, and a lot of what we're talking about today, um, across all of our segments. So we do about eight hours from our New York studio, four hours from LA. Um, segments are about 20, 30 minutes each, and we do about 30 per day. Um, you know, and there was a lot of real-time activity happening on the platform. Um, we didn't really have the opportunity to do Ajax refreshing. Um, we had to sort of react and be very real-time for both commenting and sort of as segments were transitioning throughout the day, we didn't really have the you know, luxury of just sort of like doing an Ajax poll because at that point it's too late. You know, if a producer wants to transition a segment, it happens. All users need to be in sync at that moment. Um, so browser refresh was not really an option. And we couldn't just say, you need to be on an HTML5 browser to use our application. Um, you know, with such a large user base, our browsers are all over the place. So we couldn't just say, sorry, IE 10 and above, or IE 9, Chrome and Firefox 26, whatever version we're at right now. Um, so we needed flexibility in terms of reaching the users and being able to do real time. So just to kind of show you real quick what things look like. Um, so this is HuffPost Live right now. So across the top are our segments. And I'm just going to pause because the bandwidth is probably no good. Um, so across the top are all of our real-time segments, and these are being controlled by producers. Um, so you know we have traditional production studios in New York and LA, and there's a production team that's controlling what all the end users see. So as soon as all the rage is over, there's a producer in a studio that's going to trigger the diabolmia segment to come up next, and all users need to react at the same time. Now we also do some tricks because obviously there's buffering with video, so we do some tricks on the JavaScript side that we actually queue the event. So we see based on the timestamp of the event, um, and we wait until you've actually reached that timestamp on the video stream so we don't prematurely transition you. But the events need to happen in real time. And we need to be able to control uh, the, all the users seeing that event at the same time. 
the comments, which should be flowing down the right. Again, uh, it's not doing polling, using WebSockets. These come in in real time. People can post text or video comments. Uh, and below the video here is kind of what we call our resource well. So again, this is something that can be pushed in real time from the production studio. So the concept here is that if someone says something completely ridiculous and one of the producers says, I'm going to go prove them wrong with this Wikipedia article, they can go into our CMS, pull up a Wikipedia article, publish it to the site and say, you know, and they will talk to the host and the host will say, hey, we just posted the Wikipedia article that actually proves you wrong, so click below. So a lot of real-time uh, integration to the platform, commenting, uh, resource well below the fold, and the video transitions across the top. So I'm just going to close this to save my browser. All right, a uh, quick overview of our tech stack. Um, so we have CMS and a bunch of JSON APIs, which is now powered by Ruby and Rails for both those applications. Um, we're a very heavy client-side application, so a lot of our logic is actually done in Backbone.js, which is a sort of lightweight uh, you know, JavaScript framework. So basically what happens is Backbone controls a lot of the view logic, all on the JavaScript and the client side. Um, the Ruby API exposes a bunch of JSON APIs, um, which really happens essentially on load. Um, a large majority of what happens after page load is happening via WebSockets. Um, and then we have our CMS application that our production team uses to kind of control all the metadata. Um, that's a Ruby app as well. Um, Erlang, obviously, is doing a lot with WebSockets and SockJS, um, and also the AMQP bridge. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but something else we had to build was <clears throat> almost the equivalent of Shovel. So we have a, an Erlang app that is a consumer and a producer. And the only reason we didn't really use Shovel is we had to do some kind of wacky JSON transformation between the two RabbitMQ endpoints, um, but it actually ended up working pretty well. Um, so I won't talk too much about that, but there is a, that is another place where we use uh, Erlang and our infrastructure. MongoDB on the back end, document-oriented database, suited us very well for uh, CMS-like data. Memcache, traditional key, uh, key values caching. Varnish for some API edge caching and Elasticsearch. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Elasticsearch. It's sort of a distributed version of Lucene in Solar. It has a nice, very uh, restful interface for doing search, and it's really elegant. So if you're using uh, Lucene or Solar, definitely take a look at Elastic. It's, it's really nice. All right, so what kind of real-time messages do we have on the platform? So we have comments that are being ingested from our central commenting platform. Um, I'll talk about that in a second, but you know, we have a whole comment infrastructure that was kind of outside HuffPost Live that deals with the massive comment volume that we have. Um, <clears throat> again, video transitions being initiated by our production team from our internal CMS. So, one of the really innovative things we did was bring a web platform into a traditional news studio. So we have producers, associate producers, executive producers, literally controlling what end, user, end users experience from a web portal, um, which is really has, has been very unique to what we've been doing. So there are producers in a traditional studio with our CMS open on a laptop, kind of controlling what everybody's seeing. Um, and again, resources below the video player. You know, this is what I mentioned before. Um, you know, there's a whole team of people, and if someone says something or new information comes in, a tweet, a comment, we can push it right to the app in real time. We don't have to worry about people refreshing. Um, the other thing was, you know, we wanted to be able to support various inputs to publish a real time message. Um, we didn't have one quote unquote producer. Uh, a message can come from an Erlang app, uh, directly from RabbitMQ, an HTTP consumer, a Ruby application. There are various inputs. Uh, to being a producer. So we needed something that was going to be very generic that allowed any, any mechanism to publish a message as long as it was compliant to what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so again, needed something very generic. All right, so not to get too contentious into all this stuff because we can probably go on forever, but some things that we looked at, the obvious thing that I think people default to, Node.js, Socket.io. Um, SockJS, which is why we're here, uh, EM WebSocket, CometD, and you know, uh, real time in WebSockets is exploding. This list can be 50 pages long, to be completely honest. So, just kind of a quick overview of some of our results. So, Node.js, Socket.io, um, we didn't want to flash fallback for WebSockets, and I won't get too much into it, but you know, uh, I believe Socket.io actually upgrades to WebSockets and um, uses a flash fallback, which requires port 843, and there's like a default three second timeout for flash. It's pretty messy. Um, Node itself didn't really have a great story, at least not when we looked at it. You know, 
Evan did a really great job on the last side showing some of the madness with deferred callbacks in JavaScript. That stuff is crazy. Um, the concurrency story was not great. It's JavaScript. It's single-threaded. You know, at that time, the way to get concurrency in Node.js was one, to run one instance of Node per core. To me, it was asinine. Um, I think they're fixing some of these issues, but again, there just wasn't a great story yet there. Um, I believe for horizontal scaling, we need a persistent backend, and I believe the only persistent backend that's currently supported is Redis. Um, and then the final nail in the coffin for us there was that the whole focus of Socket.io was actually transitioning to Engine.io. Um, so I think they realized that Socket.io was kind of too big. They wanted to you know, kind of move towards a more generic transport mechanism, so things were evolving to Engine.io. I don't know. We kind of felt like they had to get their stuff sorted out, and we just didn't really have a lot of faith there. Uh, EM WebSocket, obviously we're using a lot of Ruby, so we took a look at some Ruby solutions. Um, we quite honestly didn't give it a lot of investment. We just didn't think that Ruby out the gate was going to be the right choice for concurrency and scale. I love Ruby. We use Ruby uh, for real time and concurrency, probably not the best choice. Um, we spent a little time looking at Comet D. Um, at the time, there was really only a long polling option. Uh, WebSocket seemed a little bit buggy and not fully supported. I think it was disabled by default. Uh, again, we weren't getting a lot of warm and fuzzy feelings as we kind of dove into Comet D. So then we came across SockJS. Um, not sure if anyone knows about SockJS. Um, so the things that we liked, uh, number one, no flash fallback. Absolutely no flash required. Um, the other things we liked, auto fall back to other protocols. We didn't have to worry about what browsers supported, right? Um, we didn't have to get into this game of, if I'm on Chrome and I support WebSockets, do X. If I only support XHR polling, do this. If there's a bug in this browser, disable JSONP. Didn't have to get into that. Um, so that enabled our code to be very generic. We didn't really care about how the transport was happening. We had our backbone models tied into callback events from SockJS, and all the plumbing, you know, we've been talking about plumbing for two days now, was handled by SockJS. It dealt with figuring out what the browser supported. We didn't have to get worried about it. Um, and that was a real nice thing for us. Um, another nicety was just native WebSocket client support. So one of the things about SockJS is it actually implements the WebSocket protocol as its transport. So even if you're not using a SockJS client, you can actually port a, uh, point a standard, I forget which RFC it is, 64, 55, I think, um, client at a SockJS server, and it will work, which is nice. And I'll talk about kind of how we use that in a minute for mobile. Um, load balancer support, no shared state. This was another nicety. Um, if you need to scale SockJS, you add more nodes. There's uh, some built-in supports for load balancing um, and horizontal scalability. We didn't have to worry about kind of getting into back-end shared state and kind of, you know, how to scale another back-end. Um, you can kind of scale just like you do a load balancer, uh, a web server. Put it behind a load balancer, add more nodes, and you're kind of good to go. And it was written in our language. Well, that was a plus. If you guys have questions, just jump in. You don't have to wait to the end. So what was our decision? Surprise, SockJS. Um, like I said before, uh, basically there's a SockJS client JavaScript API. We wired that into our backbone applications. You know, it has some very basic sort of you know, on-message, on-close type events in the JavaScript library. We wired that into our backbone models, nice seamless integration, no clunky browser detection anywhere happening. All we really had is a really nice transport JavaScript library, really seamlessly integrated into our backbone models. So everything was really pure, simple, consistent. <clears throat> um, the other thing that was really good is that we were tested and then now are currently using in production uh, native WebSocket client. So uh, our iOS, right now we have an iPad app out. Um, we did some POCs with Flash and Android, and that worked as well. But native, website, native WebSocket clients uh, work out of the box. No problems. We're using them today in our iPad app in production. Um, and like I mentioned before, you know, not a lot of scaling uh, concerns. We treat it like a web server, put it behind a load balancer. If we need to support more connections, add more boxes. Um, this was a really nice thing for us. Um, what is SockJS? SockJS, and I'm just going to read it to you, is a browser JavaScript library that provides a WebSocket-like object. It gives you a coherent cross-browser JavaScript API, which creates a low-latency, full-duplex, cross-domain communica communication channel between the browser and the web server. Under the hood, SockJS tries to use native WebSockets first. If that fails, it can use a variety of browser-specific transports, XHR polling, JSONP, all this other stuff. So basically, SockJS is a transport. So it implements the WebSocket uh, framing and protocol 
but it uses its own transport, right? Um, this is very nice. This just makes things very consistent, uh, very predictable. I wouldn't really have to get too bogged down into how things are uh, getting communicated, right? SockJS implements its own native protocol. Um, the other thing that's nice on the back end, if you want to write your own SockJS server, um, so the SockJS server is in Erlang, which is what we use, obviously. Um, there is one for Node, for Python. Um, there's a whole set of protocol tests. So since SockJS is a very well-defined protocol, if you want to write your own SockJS server, the protocol is well-defined. And there's a whole suite of, I think they're written in Python, tests to validate that your server is implementing the protocol according to the spec. Um, so it's really well-defined and really very nice. Load balancing SockJS. So basically, there's a predefined URL structure here. Um, so from the SockJS protocol, the session between the client and the server is always initialized by the client. The client chooses the server ID, which is just a three-digit random number. So basically, when you put your nodes behind your load balancer, you could just use URL hashing. The load balancer persists the URL to the same node. We don't have to worry about, you know, uh, well, what happens if my next request goes on to node B when I was on node A? That doesn't happen, right? So uh, the URL hashing just ensures consistency that the same user is talking to the same node. Um, and then the load balancer, by doing URL hashing, could just sort of horizontally scale as we add more nodes. Really simple. Our comments workflow. So um, I'll talk a little bit about this. So comments at the Huffington Post are actually all moderated. Um, we have a whole infrastructure around machine learning technology for moderating comments. So we can detect if comments are abusive, um, you know, using certain language that's inappropriate. So the workflow uh, at a high level is a comment comes in, we submit a comment to our comment infrastructure. The machine learning technology analyzes it and basically makes three decisions. Auto approve, auto reject, or I'm not sure. The I'm not sure column basically goes to a team of moderators that can do something ridiculous, like 20 comments a minute per person. Um, and they literally are manually approving comments in this gray area. Um, so yeah, auto rejected, auto approved. Um, so, you know, we're constantly feeding back into the model. Um, it's kind of hard to say a success rate. You know, we have a, we have some, some dials we can turn in terms of how sensitive, the system's called Julia. Uh, we have some dials that we can turn up and down on how sensitive we want to make it. So over the last few years, we've gotten the dial to a point where, you know, we're comfortable that what's getting auto-approved is safe, what's rejected is uh, indeed not something we want, and the manual queue is definitely in this sort of gray area. So that's uh, you know a constant refeeding of you know the machine learning technology. Oh, that's a good question. So what percentage is getting auto approved? I actually don't know. It's a good question. Um, I want to say I don't know. I'm going to try and guess. I won't try and guess. Um, so. Real-time comments was one of our primary use cases for WebSockets. Um, and that comment infrastructure, this is where that AMQP bridge came into place. So comments get posted to this whole machine learning workflow. When they publish the approved messages, either from the manual or the automated machine learning technology, it just got posted to a RabbitMQ topic. We had an AMQP consumer just sitting there listening, saying, let me know when you got comments. And then we would just kind of shovel them over into the real-time infrastructure. Um, so that's where the AMQP bridge was uh, being used. Uh, CMS workflow. So this was another input for us. So again, we had producers in control rooms uh, managing the real-time web portal. So they were literally deciding, um, you know, when videos were in transition. And the thing that's tricky about this is, you know, videos buffer, right? So what people see on the web is about 30 to 40 seconds on average behind what's happening in a studio. So there's some really tricky timing issues. So a producer sees what's happening in real time because people are there, and they say, okay, we're on the next segment. They push a button. So then we have to say, OK, I got an event, but I'm actually buffering 30 seconds. If I transition you now, I'm actually going to prematurely transition you, and you haven't finished watching the previous segment. So we had to do some analysis by looking at the time code on the video stream, the timestamp of the WebSocket event, and put in like an arbitrary buffer on the JavaScript side to ensure that things were in sync. Um, and that's been working really well, but that was definitely a challenge. Um, but you know, again, one of the things that we really did was put the power of literally controlling what end users see in the hands of our production team. Um, you know, it wasn't scripts that were run or anything like that. It was producers, traditional news producers with a CMS pushing buttons that were publishing, uh, you know, real-time messages 
into the infrastructure. So on the Ruby side, we were using uh, AMQP event machine, which basically just throws an event machine uh, loop on the Ruby side, and there's a really nice AMQP client that we wired into the Rabbit workflow. So whenever someone would hit a button, Ajax call on the UI, on the back end, we would just do sort of a, a RabbitMQ publish through the event machine library on the Ruby side. So just a couple of things, you know, when we were figuring this all out, um, well, number one, no one knew a lick of Erlang, which, yeah, I don't know, uh, maybe it wasn't the best choice, but something we uh, wanted to embrace. And we didn't have a lot of time. So everything got built in, you know, between the CMS, the client-side UI, the AMQP bridge, the WebSocket infrastructure. Um, everything was about three to four months from first line of code to basically in production. Um, the native support for WebSockets and the load balancers, we're using Citrus NextScalers. Uh, was beta. That wasn't very comforting. Um, before that was in there, it, the Netscalers didn't know what to do, and they basically auto-defaulted everyone down to polling. So luckily, Citrix had support for WebSockets, but it was beta. Fortunately, we didn't have any issues there. Um, and message latency. You know, we really needed to ensure, we don't have a very high throughput, but we wanted very low latency. So when a producer in a control room says, change the segment, and if there's 50,000 people watching, we needed very high guarantees that all 50,000 were gonna get the message in less than a second, right? So that was our really big focus, was not so much on throughput, but latency. Um, and uh, we didn't know if it would work. You know, you don't have a lot of time and you're kind of taking some gambles. So let's talk about what it is. So we called it Outbreak, and Outbreak is basically a set of infrastructure middleware components that allowed a generic mechanism to pub and subscribe. Um, and the idea was basically build this with the mindset of being reused more broadly as time went on. We didn't want to build too specific. What I mean by that is when we do pub sub, we didn't want to have to modify our code and say, okay, we have this big case statement that says, okay, case when channel is uh, chat and then have to like push a new version of the app because we added a new channel type or new things that the app had to be aware of. We wanted something very generic, right? Plumbing. If you publish a message and you subscribe to that message, we will deliver it. We don't care really what's in it. You just subscribe to the common format that we define, and we will push the message to everyone and listening for that. So we didn't want everything, anything that was really too specific that just said, okay, if you're a comment, we know what to do. If you're not a comment, well, we gotta push a new version of the app. So that was very important to us because there was a lot of different types of messages we were pushing. Um, again, very simple and generic. Consumers wait for messages for the channels they're subscribed to. Producers send a message to a predefined RabbitMQ topic. So I'll talk about this in a second, but we use uh, the concept of RabbitMQ routing to map the subscription model. Um, and Outbreak basically bridges the two, right? So Outbreak sits in the middle, uses the RabbitMQ topic structure to determine what the message is, where it should go, and then who it should go to. So this is kind of a workflow of what happens. Um, so a producer, a producer can be anything. A producer is uh, essentially, in this case, anything that can generate an AMQP message into a RabbitMQ topic. So when I publish a message, I use a very specific uh, routing key structure. Um, if you're not familiar with RabbitMQ, RabbitMQ has this concept of routing keys that determines how you listen and how you publish, and you can sort of partition off consumers that way. So we use topics and routing keys very heavily in this model. So the routing key structure is basically a prefix, which in this case is just outbreak, dot channel, dot ID. Very generic. So our Erlang server, uh, for all intents and purposes, consists of two main gen servers. Our PubSub server, that was basically a RabbitMQ consumer, and the WebSocket server. So this was the SockJS component listening for end users for subscriptions. So what happens here? A user comes in, and we're gonna use a chat room with an ID of 102 in this example. A user comes in from the JavaScript side and sends a JSON payload of subscription chat room 102. The WebSocket server receives it, it parses that out as a subscription, stores that subscription in an ETS table. On the production side, we produce a message, we say whatever the payload of the message is. We use the routing key of outbreak.channel.chatroom.102, which matches the subscription. The PubSub server consumes the message, it parses the routing key, chops off the prefix, the second uh, element after the dot is the channel. The third element after the dot is the ID. So that allows us to convert the routing key to a channel and an ID, which matches the subscription. So now we have a routing key subscription of, of chat room 102. So we basically query the ETS table, 
when this message comes in, it says, give me all the connection objects that have this tuple. We go into here into a broadcast, and then every user that came in with that same subscription now gets broadcast that message. So imagine this Erlang server box, just imagine essentially n of those. Those are all the nodes that sit behind the load balancer. So now a topic, by design, broadcasts the same message to every node. So that's how we sort of scale horizontally. So every Erlang server here is all, each one's gonna get a copy of the same message. The reason why that's okay is because a user is only bound to one Erlang server. So there's no risk of duplication. So that's how we get sort of our horizontal scalability, and that's how we do some of the mapping. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail with an example. Um, but that's kind of the topic, uh, the routing key from the topic mapping to the subscription. So subscribing. Um, basically, we built, and the nice thing about SockJS is it's just a transport. So you can do whatever you want over that transport. You build your own application logic on how messages get sent back and forth. So we built a very simple JSON structure on top of that, um, and a very simple format. Action, action name, channel, channel name, ID, ID name. Very simple. Um, so the subscribers uh, give the channel and the ID they're interested in. Um, we basically support three actions, sorry. Sub, unsub, and query. Very simple. Sub is subscribe. Unsub is unsubscribe. Query is just give me all the list of things I'm subscribed to. Um, and that's something we would more use on the back end of our JavaScript side. Um, that's the, that is it for subscription. One little small JSON payload. Yeah, that's specific to application logic. So okay, HuffPost Live, all those segments come back with an ID. We use that same ID for the subscription. And then our CMS knows the same ID, so when we publish, they, admit, they match. But it could be anything. Um, basically, as I mentioned before, when a, a subscription or an unsubscription is received, we basically just store that with the SockJS connection object in an ETS table. Um, the SockJS object is a little bit special, which I'll talk about in a second. but Really straightforward. We take the JSON payload, we parse it, which is not the most fun thing to do in Erlang, but we parse it, um, and we start with the connection object. We also, it's an ordered ETS table, so we anchor on channel and ID. Uh, an ordered ETS select is faster um, when the thing is anchored to the front, something I learned. Um, the connection object from SockJS is special because it allows us to simply extract it from the ETS table and just call a send method on it. It's one of those special tuples where it's, uh, I think SockJS session is the first element and the rest are the parameters to the, the send method. So it's really easy for us to do a, an ETS select, query all the connection objects that match and just do a connection send on all those objects and then the broadcast happens. Um, the connection object only lives on one node. Again, we don't have to worry about sending a message to a user on another node. Each node is responsible for the users that are connected to it. Um, there is no communication between SockJS nodes. They know absolutely nothing about each other. Um, and we'll show in the publishing slides how we use this to basically just loop through uh, all matching connections. Uh, so publishing. Currently we leverage RabbitMQ as our publishing queue. Um, we rely very heavily on the concept of routing keys and topics, as I mentioned, um, and we don't require any SockJS node to be aware of any other node. Um, and again, this was a really important architectural decision for us. Topics are leveraged so that all nodes receive a copy, as I mentioned. Um, as we add more nodes, the, uh, the Erlang uh, Rabbit uh, consumer fires up. Rabbit just knows there's another listener for that topic and messages get broadcast to that new node. Uh, no config necessary. We just literally turn it on. Um, when a message is published, it's published to a single topic using uh, the format that I mentioned. Prefix is just a namespace for the messages and then channel and ID. Um, and then all the consumers basically listen on prefix.pound. So in RabbitMQ, when you have a hierarchy of, of a routing key here, a pound means any level deep of a routing key. An asterisk, I believe, is just one level. So basically what this means is I'm gonna listen for every routing key that starts with prefix dot, anything afterwards. <clears throat> and that's how the consumers basically know to listen for anything on that and not have to worry about, again, what that structure is. I don't have to program the consumers to say, okay, you're listening for outbreak dot comments, outbreak dot live transitions. It's very generic. So any channel and ID combination will flow through without any of the applications really having to care or know why it's flowing through that workflow there. And again, the routing key is critical. This is what maps both sides of the equation. 
So just to talk through how this works, we'll do a quick pub sub example. So two users want to listen to a chat room, user A, user B, um, and each are bound to a different SOC.js node. So they both send the JSON payload to the server, action sub, channel chat room, ID 103. Totally arbitrary, you know, 103 would come from probably some, some JSON API that determines what channel you're in, and then your, uh, your JavaScript client would, you know, send the subscription event. Each SOC.js node inserts one record to the ETS table on each node uh, with a SOC.js session object and the subscription. So now we have this tuple with the SOC.js connection on two different nodes, one for user A, one for user B. Neither know anything about each other. So we have a publish. So a moderator in the back end, say, wants to broadcast the message to all the users in chat room 102. So a moderator in the back end, say there's some web UI, um, decides to publish a message to chat room 102, 103. Maybe I changed numbers. I'm not sure. It should be consistent. <laughs> uh, he publishes a message to a RabbitMQ topic using the routing key outbreak.chatroom.103. Uh, uh, the consumer on both the SOCJS nodes receives a message <clears throat> on the topic with a routing key, outbreak chat room 103. Uh, the server parses that, converts it to channel chat room, ID 103. That forces an ETS select for the tuple, chat room 103. The connection object comes back from that tuple. We literally throw into a, a, a loop, and we just call connection send on um, the payload that got sent from that message. So some challenges. Uh, so the model suits us, but we are bound by the performance of a single rabbit server. Not even close to an issue for us, but architecturally, uh, we are bound to the throughput of a single rabbit server. Um, you know, it's not distributed pub sub that way. Um, so just something to be aware of. You know, I think you can probably easily do 20, 30,000 messages a second on a rabbit MQ node. So unless you're doing like market data, probably not an issue. Um, monitoring rabbit MQ was a little bit of a pain, um, but we actually got it to a really, really great place. Um, we've done extensive testing with just randomly shutting down rabbit nodes, turning them back on, and our reconnection logic has been flawless. We've had network interrupts in the data center, um, you know, just random upgrades of rabbit servers. Uh, the app doesn't even hitch. Um, native mobile clients need to use the native WebSockets. So SockJS has some heartbeats built into it. When you use the native WebSocket client, you do have to implement your own heartbeats. Um, that was one thing that we uh, came to figure out. And uh, you know, making a release, I don't know, maybe this was just me and my team, but uh, we battled Rebar and RHEL tool for a lot. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's fine now. It's great. It just, uh, I don't know, we had a lot of problems just getting things to a really happy place. But now everything actually works great. We have everything wired into our CI server. We do a build. Things get zipped up, are synced over to the servers. Everything's nice and happy. Which part? The, the lack of oh, RHEL tool? Yeah, the long battle, but now it works great. Oh, uh, it's if just. If you guys had to do it over again, would it be, you know, how much of it was learning curve versus? Um, you know, I just didn't, uh, I just remember like the integration with Rebar and RHEL tool, it just wasn't very well documented. Um, it took a lot of looking at sample apps to figure out like directory structure and when you make a release, the parent directory has to be named the same name as your release, just these little quirks that we certainly didn't find anywhere on the internet, but we learned it, and now we create very happy tarballs. Did you find that you learned when you published your findings on the virus tool and then came to the We could do that. <laughs> I have to go back now and remember all the pain points, but yeah, we could do that. Did Sorry. What's that? Did you try rebar? Yeah, we, we have rebar and rel tool. Um, and I forget the whole workflow. You know, there's a rebar release workflow. But then I believe we had to make a bunch of changes to the rel tool config. Um, I don't know. Maybe. Is this other thing called rel core? Is that what you're talking about? Rel core? Yeah, that's a new tool to automate the whole release process. I haven't heard of rel core. Rel cool. Like oh, rel cool. Sorry. No, I'm not familiar with rel cool. Um, again, it was just a, really a matter of just small configuration tweaks about where dependencies lived and some directory structure layouts. It really wasn't anything crazy. It was just. Uh, I needed another bullet. So we, we had a guy come and show us that, and, and it took about five minutes to get released. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, in hindsight, it's yeah. easy as heck now. So when we create new apps, it's two seconds. Uh, like I said, it was just kind of getting there was a little bit painful. Um, but I guess that's subjective. Uh, 
Uh, a little bit on performance. So we got SockJS to about 100,000 connections pretty easily on a single node, which was more than we needed with about sub-second latency. Um, a lot of tuning, plus P, syscall. Uh, one thing I'll say about SockJS, and this is something my team's trying to work on, we do have a fork of SockJS right now that we're in progress on that's uh, integrating Cowboy Point 8. But really, uh, this last two bullets are really where SockJS Erlang really needs the most help from the community. Um, Basically, SockJS relies a lot on JSON encoding to standardize how the browser and the backends communicate. And it's just a little bit of a, I'll just say design flaw. I don't mean that with any disrespect because Marek is a genius. But um, basically, when you do a broadcast, it actually JSON encodes to every subscriber of a message. And really what it should be doing is JSON encoding once and then sending that JSON encoding mes message out to all the consumers. Uh, right now, it's JSON encoding every message out. So it's really just a matter of just reworking that workflow. So it's something we've been looking at contributing back. But if you guys are interested in getting involved in an open source project, feel free to take a look at that. Um, I think that would be a massive performance gain. Um, and there's, you know, I spoke to Merrick a little bit. There are some optimizations as well. There's a lot of message passing that goes on when all these message, messages go through the, uh, the real-time infrastructure. And I think a lot of this can be minimized to improve uh, some of the performance as well. But the JSON encoding is certainly one of the biggest ones. Uh, some kernel tooting. This is pretty boring. This is kind of some stock, you know, AOL HuffPost kernel tooting stuff. But you do have to tune your kernel to get concurrency up. Uh, you know, max ports, again, something we found. Uh, this by default, I think, is 4,096. And we were bottlenecking at like 4,096 connections, which seemed really odd for an Erlang server. We had like an eight core box with 16 gigs of RAM, and I'm like, this can't be possible, right? You know, Erlang's passing and winning all these C10K tests. I'm like, 4,000 connections. So we did a bunch of research, and you know, we played a lot with these two parameters, and that got us up to about 100,000 connections before you know, CPU and latency started to dive off. But again, if we fix some of the JSON encoding issues, I believe that the number will go even higher, staying within the sub-second latency number, uh, time frame. So what's next? Uh, we want to open source Outbreak. Right now, it's not open source. We are working on open source in the project. Um, we also talked about kind of making thing, uh, the Outbreak more configurable by not relying explicitly on RabbitMQ, but having this concept of basically adapters, you know, kind of how React has like these pluggable backend concepts. So if you don't want to use Rabbit, use whatever queuing system you want, um, and basically making those more generic. You know, we are tied into the whole routing key concept, so we'd have to figure out how that mapped and that worked. Um, but we would like some flexibility in terms of making uh, Outbreak a bit more generic in that regard. Um, exposing an HTTP interface, you know, sometimes clients don't really want to go, you know, even on the Ruby side, um, you know, getting event machine running if you're not using an event machine based Ruby server is not always the most fun. Sometimes it's just simpler if you want to just do an HTTP publish. So it's something else we've been looking at, just exposing an HTTP interface. Um, you know, fixing uh, some of the SockJS performance issues. And last but not least, we're hiring. So if you want to live in New York and be an engineer, Email me. That's it. Thank you, guys. Right on time. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, so you, you said you made the decision to use SockJS because it was Erlang based, but then you said nobody knew Erlang. So why did you guys make that decision? Does that make sense? I mean, uh, that required a I agree. Um, so the SockJS choice specifically was, you know, we really liked the sort of agnostic nature in which the browsers, we didn't have to worry about browsers. So that part was really nice about SockJS. Um, Erlang was just something as a team we discussed. You know, we really wanted something that can handle concurrency. Um, and, you know, it's just where we ended up. You know, there was a risk, but, you know, no risk, no reward. Yeah, um, so there were some Erlang developers in AOL, as Alex knows. Um, so we did have some reference points. Um, so we weren't totally in the dark, um, but it was definitely new from a programming standpoint. So yeah, I mean, look, there was risk, but it, it just after evaluating everything, it just felt like the right choice, even with the risk of not knowing the language. So. Well, congratulations. Oh. 
So it worked out, but you know, you never know. Um, but yeah, if you guys are not familiar with Stock.js, uh, Marek is a really great guy. I actually had the opportunity to meet him. He, uh, he's in New York for the Hacker School program for a few months. You know, really smart guy. He's done a great job. And you know, I think with everything happening with WebSockets, I think the stuff he's doing is actually really innovative in terms of you know, giving you a platform to really build consistent web applications because browsers are a nightmare. So, <laughs> Any other questions? Um, any other pain oh, points? Like you know, not really. You know, outside of just having to learn, you know, standard OTP principles and, you know, just doing things the right way, um, things went surprisingly smooth. Um, you know, the community was extremely helpful. You know, we'd post once in a while. Um, so we got through it with, really without a lot of pain. I mean, really, making the release was probably one of the worst pain points. Um, and some of the tuning stuff, you know, that took a little bit of research in terms of kernel tuning and VM tuning, but you know, outside of that, you know, everything worked about as good as we could have hoped. Yeah. Like, would you envision that you ever start using Erlang for other parts of the infrastructure besides the? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, which is why it was great to see Evan talk about Chicago Boss. I think personally, one of the weaker points of Erlang is, you know, building web APIs. Um, so I think that's probably one of the only places where we evaluated other decisions. But I think anything that involves, um, you know, real-time messaging, you know, everyone's been extremely happy with Erlang. I mean, our servers and our apps have been just humming along. Rabbit servers, they don't crash, but we take them down, network outages, all kinds of stuff, and, you know, uh, we haven't had one issue with any of our apps. They just run, and so we've been extremely happy. Mm -hmm. So wherever we can use it, I think we would, for sure. So so in Huffington Post, we have PHP, we have Ruby, we have Erlang. We are making a little bit of an investment in Scala, a uh, little bit of Python, a ton of JavaScript. Yeah. It's kind of a big polyglot of languages. Yeah. So would you say that like, you have had more trouble with some other languages besides Erlang? So, I mean, like, uh, it's kind of an opinionated question. I mean, I think most people in this room would say JavaScript sucks. Um, you know, I like Ruby, but it's a little bit slow. So I, I think it's, you know, right tool for the right problem. You know what I mean? Like for CMS, the Ruby stuff has worked out great. Um, enabled us to develop very quickly. You know, for WebSockets, you know, Ruby's probably a bit more of a hesitant choice. I think Erlang was certainly the right choice for us. So I think it's a right tool for the job kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have our own data centers. Uh, we only need one. So, yeah, I mean, we don't really share how many nodes. Um, right now, we probably don't. We have like a handful of nodes, nothing too crazy. Um, but, you know, I mean, based on the numbers I showed, you don't need, there's no minimum. You can run on one if you want to do something like that. But um, it's horizontally scalable like a web server. So based on your concurrency, you add as many nodes as you need. I mean, it's a latency concurrency you know, game, right? You could probably support more than 100,000 connections on a SOC.js node, but your latency is going to go up. So that's just kind of the balance you got to play with. Why do we need backend persistence? Oh, we don't, there is none. Well, we route the, the user to the same server so we don't have to worry about sending messages and figuring out where they are in the cluster, right? So. Since one user can only ever be mapped to one server, we can comfortably broadcast every message to every server and know it's only ever going to be destined for one user. For the so it just prevents having to have like a back end shared state and say, oh, hey, user A, you're on node two. User B, you're on node three. And then you have all this routing logic. And now you have another single point of, not single point of failure, but another back end to worry about. So th there's, some, uh, there's some timeout logic on the JavaScript side. So basically, you know, I mean, there are some extreme conditions, but you know, we've tested shutting down a node. Uh, there are some callbacks that happen on the JavaScript side that have a timeout, and we just issue a, issue a reconnect, and the user resubscribes. So we, we've done some pretty uh, some pretty thorough testing on the JavaScript side with that. How's Mongo's <laughs> Mongo's fine. I feel like that's a question for beers. Um, 
My honest answer, because we're going through this now, I think the global write lock on Mongo is idiotic. Um, it's my personal opinion. They've gotten it better. It's down to database level. But the Mongo da so we have one database, so we're fine. We have other scenarios where we have, uh, we have to basically roll out multiple databases, because right now on 2.2 and above, Mongo locks at the database level, which is insane. Um, so I don't know. It's fine. I would use it with caution. The out-of-the-box defaults for Mongo are completely unsafe. All right, there's, there's no guarantees out of the box. Um, so, you know, if you're writing like a CMS and you need guaranteed, trans, not even transactions, but you need to ensure your data is written to disk, you need to change the defaults. So it's been fine for us, um, you know, but I, I think it needs to be used with caution. Anything else? All right, thank you guys. <laughs>